There are three different ways we can solve a quadratic equation. We're going to look today at some different types of problems where you can apply those skills. To quickly recall, we can solve a quadratic equation by graphing and getting those x-intercepts, by factoring, setting the factors equal to zero and solving for x, or by using the quadratic formula. There are advantages and disadvantages to each method. If the question specifies that you must do it algebraically, be aware graphing is not an algebraic method. You can either factor or use the quadratic formula. Those are your algebraic methods. There's advantages and disadvantages to each, as you've probably discovered. So a graph is very visual. We should always do a sketch anyway, just to kind of get an idea of what's happening in our question. It can be time consuming. By the time you go through it with the calculator steps, that takes a little bit of time. Factoring is very fast. So if you can factor, and if if the quadratic equation is factorable, because remember not all are, then that's probably the fastest method. And if you can't factor it, or even if you can't quickly factor it, if the numbers are really large, then the quadratic formula will always work. And the other thing that the quadratic formula does is it will always give you those exact values. If the roots are irrational, this method works. One example you might encounter is a question where you're given different operations and have to determine two or more numbers. The key here is we have to be able to go about doing this algebraically. You may look at this question and automatically know what those numbers are. However, what we're trying to get at is can we use an algebraic process in order to generate those values? All right, so first thing we know is that sum is addition and we know product is multiplication. I'm going to set this up. So I don't know what the values of those numbers are. I'm going to use variables to represent them. So my number plus another number is 14. My number times another number is 45. So I'm just going to write that 45 in there. All right, so we can't solve a question with two variables in it. We're going to go back to what we did in grade 10 in the systems of equations unit where we can combine these two together in order to be able to solve them. So I'm going to take a look and I'm going to say, okay, in one of these equations, am I able to isolate one of those variables? Now you could isolate one of these variables. However, if we're going to, let's say, isolate n, we have to divide out m, which means you're now dealing with 45 divided by m, which is possible, but if you don't love working with fractions, you may want to take a look at this one. I can again isolate n by subtracting m. That's going to give me n equals 14 minus n, which is going to be a lot easier to work with. So both work, but I'm going to go with the one that's a little less uh, cumbersome. So here we go. I'm going to move over that m and get 14 minus m. And then what we can do is take a look at this and say, okay, n is equal to this value. I have an n in this uh, equation. So I'm going to substitute what n is equal to into the place of n and this will then become 14 minus m times m equals 45. My goal is to create one equation that has only one variable in it so I can solve it. So by taking what n is equal to and putting it in the place of the n, we can now solve this. So this is solving a system of equations by substitution. All right, so now we're back to what we did previously. In order to get rid of those brackets, I'm going to distribute. And so I'm going to multiply that m into my brackets here. And when I do that, I'm going to have 14m minus m squared equals 45. And then take a look at this. As soon as we have a degree two equation, we know that is a quadratic. So go back to the three methods of solving a quadratic and all three of them involve getting it into standard form. So I'm gonna do that by moving over this 45. Because there's no constant term on the left, I'm just gonna put it there. And then I'm also at the same time going to put them in order. So it's a little bit easier to work with. Okay, so I've written it in standard form, lining up the terms a, b, and c, and it's really important you make it equal to zero so that it is an equation that is able to be solved. It says I have to solve it algebraically. I can't graph it. I'm going to check first if I can factor it. I don't want to deal with this negative leading coefficient, so what I'm going to do is factor out a negative one, so that's going to give us m squared minus 14m plus 45 equals zero. We're basically switching all of those signs like that. And then I'm gonna take a look and say, okay, 
I've got an A value now in the bracket of 1. I've got a C value of 45. Are there two numbers that multiply to 45 and add to negative 14? And again, go over to the side and list your factors if you're unsure. But in this case, there are negative 5 and negative 9 are the two values that we're looking for. I'm going to leave this negative 1 out front. I'm going to set up my binomials. And when we do this, we're going to have m times m gets us back to m squared. And remember, these are my outside and inside products. So 1 times what gives us one of those numbers. Because it's a 1, I can choose either. So I'm going to put negative 5. That's my first product. And then my inside product, 1 times what, gives me that negative 9. And of course, that's going to be negative 9. All right, now we need to set the factors equal to zero and figure out what is the value of m that will make this zero? What is the value of m that will make this zero? I don't need to worry about this factor because there's no variable in it. So you at this point might be able just to look at it. I know it's going to be 9 and I know it's going to be positive 5. All right, it's important that we do a couple things here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to verify these two values. So I'm going to say, okay, I've got two solutions. Let's start with the first one. So when m is equal to 9, and then I'm going to go back over to the original equation that I started with. I'm, I know the value of m now, so I'm going to say what is that value of n? So taking that equation, um, I'm just going to go with that. n is equal to 14 minus m. What is n when m is 9? n happens to be 5. Now I'm going to check the other one. So my other solution is 5 for m. So I'm going to say when m is 5, and again, what is the value of n? So I'm going to go back to what we started with there. And when we fill this all in, we can see that we get a value of 9 for n. So these two in this particular question happen to be interchangeable. So that tells me the two numbers that give me a sum of 14 and a product of 45 are 5 and 9. In my second question, I started to set it up here just to save a little bit of time. Again, we have to solve it algebraically, so my two methods are either to solve it by factoring or by using the quadratic formula. Set up what you know. In this case, we're given the area of a rectangular garden, and we're looking for the dimensions. So remember, dimensions is the length and the width of the garden. So I drew a little sketch over here. We know that the length of the garden is five meters longer than its width. I don't know what the width is, so I use a variable to represent it. Try not to use x all the time. Choose variables that remind you of what it is that they represent. It's going to make it easier as the questions get more complex. And I know that whatever that width is, my length is 5 units longer or 5 meters longer in this case. Because we're given the area, I know that the area of a rectangle is length times width. When you substitute the area in, do not include the units. An extra variable sometimes confuses people. I put in my 200. My length is w plus 5. My width is just represented by that w. I'm going to get rid of the brackets by distributing this w in. That gives me this, which I recognize is a quadratic because of that degree 2. I know in order to solve a quadratic equation, we always put it in standard form. So I'm going to subtract that 200 to get it off of the left and then subtract 200 on this side. There is no like term. We don't have another constant here. And again, it's really important you put that equals zero so that it is solvable. In this case, we're looking for w. First thing I would do is try to factor it. But if we take a look here, 1 times negative 200 is negative 200. So if we're looking for two numbers that multiply to negative 200 and add to positive 5, there just, there are none. So that tells you it's not factorable, but even if you were to check on the graph, there are x-intercepts. So we need to go to the quadratic formula. I already have the terms lined up. So I'm going to put in negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a, my a value is 1, times c, my c value is negative 200. We're going to divide that by 2 times the a value, and the a value again is that 1. When I go to simplify this, I start with the radicand. I enter this into my calculator and end up with 825, and then multiply your denominator 2 times 1 is 2. 
Back to what we did previously, we're going to look for, is there a perfect square we can divide out of this? And that 25 should give you a clue. Try checking 25 first of all, and we see that is in fact divisible by 25, and then 33 is what's left. If we pull out, the square root of 25 is 5, so pull that 5 out, and that gives us with leaves us with negative 5 plus or minus 5. We still have a radicand of 33, and we're dividing by 2. Now, to be completely simplified, remember, we don't want any perfect squares in here. There are none that are divisible from 33, so that's good. And then the last thing you're going to do is take a look at the whole numbers. We have a negative 5, a positive 5, and a 2. Is there a number other than 1 that's divisible by those three numbers? There is not, so we know we're simplified. The other reason I know this isn't factorable is because the question tells me I'm rounding to the nearest hundredth. That's probably a clue that most likely those roots are not going to be whole numbers, in which case it's not factorable. So it doesn't want an exact answer in this case. I'm going to get the decimal values. So remember we talked about how to put this in your calculator last time. We're going to either bracket the numerator or just press enter after entering this. So you're going to put this in your calculator. You have to do each of them. So negative 5 plus... 5 times the square root of 33 equals divided by 2 gives you this value. Negative 5 minus 5 times the square root of 33 divided by 2 gives you this value. And please try this because you want to make sure that you can in fact enter them into your calculator correctly. All right, we know that we cannot have a negative dimension. So going back to restrictions, I'm just going to back up here and say w is going to have to be greater than 0. That tells me this root is extraneous given our context. And the one I want to go with is this value. Now we're rounding to the nearest hundredth. I know hundredth is two decimal places. I take a look, there's my second decimal place. Look at the number after. If it's five or higher, it bumps up that six. Because it's not, I know that my width is going to be 11.86 and again check your units this is in meters now we also need to get the length so there's my first dimension the second one go back over here and we know the length is w plus 5 and because we're doing this algebraically again we're going to set up the length is w plus 5 w is 11.86 add 5 to that and that tells us the length is going to be 16 0.86 meters. And again, if you want to verify this, try multiplying them together. We rounded each of these values. These are not exact values, but you should get close to the 200 that we started with. Another type of question that sometimes comes up is revenue. We did a lot of revenue when we dealt with quadratic functions. We're going to now roll it into quadratic equations. So I know that in revenue, I'm looking generally to maximize my profit. So in a revenue question, my y value is the r, n is the number of increases. In this particular case, we have a video game store, and they are renting 750 games a month at $4.50 each. So the current amount of money we're making is we just multiply price times the number sold gives us the current amount of revenue. We know that we can always set up a revenue function in the factored form. So in this case, the function that models this information is start with your current price, current number sold, and then what changes. In this case, we are increasing by $1 increments. So for every $1 increase, so we have plus 1n. When we do that, we sell 30 fewer games a month. So remember, if we sell, if we have one increase, we sell 30 less. If we have two increases, 30 times 2, we sell 60 less, and so on. Now, to turn it from a function to an equation, we replace this variable with a numerical value. This particular question wants to know, are we able to generate $7,000 a month? So I'm going to substitute in $7,000 for the revenue. And this question doesn't say that I have to do it algebraically. So because it doesn't, I'm going to graph it. And I'm going to enter my one side is y1, and I'm going to enter my other side is y2. That's going to be a little bit faster um, than trying to do getting it in standard form. Okay, so remember when we do that, that 7,000 is going to be just a horizontal line across there. And I'm looking to see, oops, 7,000, there we go. And I'm looking to see if that parabola is going to touch it. Okay, so I pulled out my calculator here. 
And we're going to enter 7,000 into Y1. And so I've already done that. I've gone in here, I've entered 7,000 into Y1, and then I've entered my second one, uh, the, se the right-hand side of this, into Y2. I've set an appropriate window. And remember, we don't get too wild on the x-axis. Don't go too high. I'm going to go from negative 10 to 20. We may have to adjust it, but we'll see what that does. I do, however, know that I'm going to have a horizontal line at 7,000. So I want to be a little bit higher than that on my y maximum. And if I'm going from negative 10 to 7,500, I put a scale of 1,000. Okay, so we're going to take a look at this. And when you look at the graph here, you can see that this is the revenue that we're generating. That's the maximum revenue. So we are not going to be able to get to that $7,000 a month. If it did want to know what the maximum revenue is, uh, we can go back into second function trace. We're looking for the maximum. And here's where you might run into problems because sometimes the calculator gets finicky. So I'm going to go actually back into y equals and I'm just gonna clear that out because we know it's not gonna generate $7,000, but it will then let us find the maximum that we have now. All right, so I'm gonna go second function trace. Now, if you did still have two graphs that crossed, you would find the point of intersection. Because I only have the one, I'm gonna look for my maximum here. So I'm gonna go to number four, and I'm gonna say, are we to the left of the vertex? Yes. I'm gonna move over here. Are we to the right of the vertex? And watch your calculator, it's prompting you. Yes. Do you want me to guess and take a look at those arrows? The vertex needs to be in between those arrows. Yes, we do. And here we go. So that tells us in this particular case that we have, remember our y-axis is the revenue. So our maximum revenue is that value when the number of increases, which is our x value, is that. And then just a quick refresher, because I think oftentimes the questions ask, what should we charge? Go back to the function that we have set up in factored form. And this is my original, this is my price bracket. So I want to figure out what's the value of n that will, in this case, let me maximize. So if I'm going to maximize, and the question, this question's not asking for that, but oftentimes your questions are going to. Just remember, if we're looking for the price that we should charge to maximize the revenue, take our price bracket, which is 450 plus 1n. We know the number of increases is that 1025. So we could substitute in 450 plus 1025, and in this particular case, that's gonna give us $14.75. So that is the price to charge to maximize our revenue, which is an awfully expensive video game. Maybe not, I don't really know. <laughs> so um, just this is not necessarily what our question's asking us here. All that our question is asking for is can we generate that $7,000 a month? This goes back to what we did in quadratic functions, but it does roll into some of the questions you're gonna do today. This is only a small sample of what you can do with quadratics. There's not necessarily one way where it's here's what you do, here's what you do, here's what you do. Part of it is being able to think through what do you know, how can you set this up, and then can we use the skills that we have and apply it to something we've potentially never seen before. Remember, you always want to draw a picture, try to visualize your information. We're going to do a few questions today, and I'm going to give you a hint on just two of them to kind of help get you set up here. So number five, you may want to grab your textbook and actually read the question uh, before you pause the video and then you can come back to it. But we know from quadratic functions, we always set up our sketch. We identify what are the two things we're comparing, which is the independent and then which is the dependent variables. Label your axes. And then any information you know, plot on there. We know he's jumping off a 7.5 meter platform. We know the maximum height is 7.94. And again, height is on the y-axis. So that y value is 7.94. He hits that height at 0.3 seconds. So we know seconds is the x coordinate. So that's why we put that in there. If we had a function, we could just graph it and get that x-intercept. This is what we're looking for, the time when he hits the water. We don't have one, so we have to first create one. So it's the same thing we did all through quadratic functions. And because the quiz is coming up, this is a good chance to go back and review that as well. 
we have a vertex, so we're going to start in vertex form. So substitute in what we know. Um, I put in height for my y, and actually we could even put in t instead of the x here if you want to do that. And then because we don't know the value of a, we have to solve that. The only other point I know on the parabola is this point at 0 and 7.5. So again, this is my y coordinate, or in this case my height. I'm going to substitute that in for h. This is my x coordinate or my time. I'm going to substitute that in for t. Algebraically, you're going to solve for a to get yourself the function. When you have the function, we're looking for what is the t value when height is 0. So we can put a 0 in for h, and basically we're going to graph that and just get that x-intercept. Number eight, one thing that comes up a lot in the next unit is dealing with consecutive numbers. And so in number eight, we have the sum of two squares. So sum we know is addition. This is the sum. And squaring, we're just going to square those. My first number, I can just represent with an n. And then consecutive means the one that follows. So if my number is five, six is the consecutive one. If my number is nine, 10 is the next consecutive one. So whatever this first number is, we add one to it to get the next consecutive one. So this now is my quadratic equation. You can FOIL that out. You're going to have some like terms. Combine them, move this over to get it into standard form, and then you can either graph it, you can factor it, or you can use the quadratic formula to get the value of n.